A reading from the Revelation to St. John the Divine. After this, I, John, looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading a portion of Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon him and be radiant, and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear him, and he will deliver them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing that is good. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants, and none will be punished who trust in him. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. 
When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they were persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship God day and night within God's temple, and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. We turn away from suffering in American 21st century culture. We keep away from our community when we are sick. We go to special places to die. We refuse to confront the reality of death. We put astroturf around the scar of an open grave. We apply makeup to the bodies of the departed and employ embalmers to erase the signs of the pain and the suffering that preceded the death. In political discourse lately, we are talking about how people view illness and suffering as a form of weakness. Maybe not directly, but if you listen to the way people talk, you can hear it. I suppose that's all a sort of victim blaming, like the idea that the poor somehow deserve their poverty because of some failing on their part to work hard enough to achieve success. And yet, you and I worry that the things we believe are our possessions and our wealth will be taken away from us and given to someone who hasn't suffered for them the way we think we have. Similarly, when someone is ill, we seek to uncover the sins that they committed that have caused this curse to be visited upon them. In earlier days, we might have imagined that a witch or an evil spirit had done something awful to them, or perhaps that the suffering that they are enduring was because they had done something awful and they were being punished justly for their transgressions. You want to see what I mean? Look at the long, long middle chapters of the book of Job and you'll hear Job's friends trying to explain his suffering in that sort of way. Of course, at the end, as you recall, God shows up and tells Job's friends that they are wrong. And it's all a bunch of hooey, and they should apologize. It's like the idea that people die of coronavirus because they lack good health, or they have other comorbidities, things that they should have taken care of before they were exposed to the virus, even just being too old, as if that was something that they could change. Today, we'll blame illness on too much drinking or smoking or eating things that taste too good, but which aren't good for you, or not working hard enough, or working too hard. Occasionally, we'll blame the environment, like lead paint or poor water, showing that we too are confused just about who has sinned to cause the suffering the person before us is enduring, the one who suffers, or the community that surrounds that one. For the book of Revelation is taking a totally different tack. The revelation that is Jesus Christ's revelation that is given to St. John and then given to the church understands suffering 
as a sign of God's presence, as a sign of something saintly and profound, and not as a failure or something to be run from or something to be avoided at all costs. The reading that we just heard is preceded immediately by the story of the 144,000, 12,000 out of all the 12 tribes who are sealed by God and, in the account, protected from any suffering. And, and it's interesting because that's what we tend to focus on, that 144,000, trying to figure out how we can get into that crowd. But the next part, the part we just read, talks about the untold, uncountable multitude who have suffered. And it's because of their suffering, the fact that they have endured the great ordeal, persecution and oppression, because of that, they stand before the throne of God. They join with the angels, they join with the cherubim, they join with the elders, and they sing praise to God continuously. It's because they endured the suffering that they are worthy to stand in the presence of God. That is totally opposed to what we tend to talk about in American culture. We try to avoid suffering at all costs. We don't see suffering as something that changes who we are. We don't see suffering in a kind of context that can be redemptive. We see suffering as only a kind of mindless pain that people have to endure. And, and I think so much of what Jesus does on the cross for us and so much of what Christian theology teaches is that suffering is not pleasant. It is not to be sought out. But when it occurs, it can be contextualized by a recognition of what Jesus endures on the cross so that it can become redemptive. Redemptive for the person who is suffering it or redemptive for the community which, on which behalf, on whose behalf, the person who is suffering endures what they have to endure. You know, it, if you listen to the language in Revelation again and again, they come back to this idea that it's the lamb that was slain who is at the center of the great thong that is singing praise to God. The lamb that was slain is Jesus, but the, the word for lamb is actually a diminutive. This isn't sort of a, 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 like a, a ram or some strong thing. This, this is a, an infant that was slaughtered. It shows Jesus as this person who unjustly deserved what Jesus had to endure. And, and that's a key thing. Again, you hear that all through the Gospels, that Jesus is innocent, that he suffers unjustly. This small white lamb that was slain, that stands before the throne of God, is the one to whom all of creation sings praise. It is that ability to suffer and suffer unjustly that seems to be the thing that transforms the world. Facing the suffering instead of fleeing it as a form of failure is what we are asked to do as Christians. We can do that because we have hope. We have hope in redemption. We have hope in resurrection. In the Bible, suffering brings maturity and character Suffering, properly understood, prepares us for what comes next, our resurrection, our ability to be fully in the presence of the Lamb that was slain. Suffering can become for us a witness. The Greek word for witness is martyr. Suffering endured, especially unjustly, becomes a witness to the world if we can recontextualize what we have to endure. I'll put that in the context of what's going on in the world around us. Put that in the context of people who are falling ill, people who are grieving, people who are being separated from the ones they love unjustly. And because some people are refusing 
to do the things that they are asked to do. Other people are suffering. We have hope. And we can endure the suffering that is put upon us in a way that makes a witness to the world. It makes the suffering we have to endure not meaningless, but purposeful. And that's what the saints do. That's why on this Feast of All Saints, we hear this particular reading. And this year, of all years, I find myself attracted to this idea. In the midst of a time when it feels like there is so much going wrong, in the midst and in a moment when we are so aware of the suffering all around us in the world, when we even hear the earth crying out in pain, we can make a witness. We can understand that this is something that is transforming us. It is something that is giving us strength. And it is something that is preparing us for the resurrection and the new life to come. For some, perhaps, there is a way to avoid suffering and come fully into the presence of God. For some, there is a ceiling that happens. But for others, for others, we have to accept what is in our path, not turn away from it, picking up our cross and following after Jesus, but understanding that in doing so, we are transforming everything. We are transforming ourselves, we are transforming our community, and along with Christ, we are transforming the cosmos. The cross that we venerate is a reminder that Jesus suffered and his suffering redeems us. When we place the suffering that we experience into that context, we participate in our day in his work of resurrection. And when we cause others to suffer, we are participating in the cause and the suffer of causing the suffering that Jesus himself had to endure. It's the flip side of the message of the cross. All Saints Day is the day we remember the people, mostly unknown to us and to history, who triumphed, not over adversity, but because of adversity. It's not a popular or common idea in society today. Again, Look how much we flee from any confrontation with pain. But it has been a part of our faith from the earliest days, and it is just as important in this moment as it was in a time of persecution and oppression. The Prayers of the People in communion with all the saints and in the name of Jesus, let the incense of our prayer ascend to God, whose children we are. We pray that, acknowledging our complete dependence on God's gracious gifts, we may be counted among the poor in spirit, whose future is God's reign. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray that those who mourn with broken hearts or spirits may be comforted by God's compassion and consoled by God's people, Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray that all who hunger and thirst for goodness in the face of human injustice may taste God's goodness in this life and may be filled in the life to come. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray that the thoughts of our hearts may direct the work of our hands and by that integrity we may behold God face to face. Gracious God, Hear our prayer. We pray especially today for those commended to our prayers. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for this week's election, that all eligible citizens might vote and all votes might be counted. Pray for our democracy. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for those suffering from the coronavirus, either through illness, loneliness, unemployment, or anxiety. For all those caring for the sick, those seeking treatments and vaccines for the virus, and all those who, whose work places them in harm's way. 
May this pandemic depart from the face of the earth, and may those who suffer in its wake be healed. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray that those persecuted for righteousness' sake may be strengthened by the promise of the kingdom they will inherit. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, including those we name now either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We pray all this in the words our Savior Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now the blessing of the one holy and undivided Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you this day, this week, and always. Amen. <laughs>